Greetings and welcome to the show, World War II Books, Where to Start. I'm your host, Admiral Hyman Rickover. And today we're going to discuss the silent service of World War II. In other words, what America and its submarines succeeded in doing against Japan versus what Germany and its U-boats failed to do against Great Britain and the United States and how they did it. And we'll kick it off with uh, Pig Boats by Theodore Roscoe, originally published in 49 reissued in 58 with this abbreviated title. It had a rather cumbersome submarine operations in World War II title to begin with, but it was uh, simplified for the public in 58, and I think it was actually a wise choice. Clocks in at 444 pages paperback, and I have the 82 edition, which is like the eighth printing. And this is a whopper for a Bantam War book. They specialized in like the 200, 250 page memoirs for the most part. They were cheap and easy to produce. This is a, a, a rather uh, big endeavor for them. Uh, being from 58, it's got a lot of stuff going on here. Now, Theodore Roscoe was a pulp writer for the most part. Short stories, fantasy, adventure stuff, a couple novels later on in life, and even a biography, I believe. Wide-ranging uh, scope of activities there, and he was recruited by the uh, U.S. Navy Office of whatever publishing, blah, 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 to produce a history of submarine operations World War II. Kind of a condensed uh, Amul uh, Admiral Samuel Elliot Morrison, which he did the 26 volume complete history of all naval operations World War II. This is just just a silent service, and um, I have to believe this is more geared towards public consumption than actual official writing for the Navy because of its pulp style. So, having said that, um, let's see. The thing about this edition is because of the length, the famous illustrations that the Band of War books are known for are cut down to size in here and really tiny. But there's a couple really good ones I want to show you. The first one is the periscope there. Just turning up the map. I kind of like that one. That's cool. And then this one, the fighting defense. Fists coming out of the ocean with the rising sun in the background. That's awesome. It kind of gives you the tone and tenor of this book. Uh, it sets the tone, it sets the uh, aspect of revenge and, and how America felt about Pearl Harbor. So you can see it's a bit propagandistic in its illustrations in that way and almost kind of comic bookish at the same time. So this baby is kind of out of, uh, for, as far as I can tell, it's out of print. Um, it had a good long run, but it is outdated and it's got a couple issues. The, the pulp writing style just comes through full force nonstop including chapter titles. They're, they're kind of cutesy alliterations and, you know, go get them kind of stuff, kind of uh, rah, 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 sis, boom, bah, as well as uh, every ship uh, name is printed in all caps every time, as well as every communication to every boat over to Pearl Harbor or enemy communications are all printed in, in all caps like the telegrams were when you sent a telegram back then. So that's very pulpy. Um, it reads like a real, it's a real barn burner. It, it's vroom, you rip right through it. I haven't touched it in a long time. I just remember the style and, and how fast you could go through it. It's not a whole lot of thought and contemplation. It ends up being a lot, a lot of chapters of adventure stories in my, in my viewpoint. Is it worthwhile to get today out of print? Uh, yes, for if you're a Bantam war book collector, sure. That's a pretty cool cover. It's got several iterations of different covers, you know, as they revamped the art from time to time. This one is one I like. So it's worthwhile for that. Is it worthwhile as a read? Probably not today. Second up is Sink Em All by Charles A. Lockwood, Vice Admiral from 1951. Uh, let's see, Charles uh, Lockwood, born in 1890, died in 1967. Vice Admiral uh, had several postings uh, throughout his career, a long, long uh, USN career. Started out in submarines and specialized in had a gunboat command in the Asiatic Squadron and a destroyer command briefly, I believe, before he settled back into a specialty and rose to command first submarine operations in one of the bases in Australia. And then when Robert English was killed in a plane crash in late 42, he was booted up to command sub submarines at Pearl Harbor. So, from 51, you can't say anything about Ultra or Magic, and I expected nothing about this going in. Admirals writing books have in the past failed me miserably, and I think here specifically of Forrest Sherman in his book Combat Command, which was a really bad combat report. 
So I went in here with no expectations of, of readability at all and was pleasantly surprised. But a quick note right here, just, okay, this is the audio edition. I know the glare and whatnot, the dark screen, but check that carrier there and the destroyer in front of it on a book about submarines. That's a fail. Anyway, so this is his uh, overall kind of glossy view of our submarine campaign against Japan in the war. And it's very positive. He's got a lot of good things to say about just about everybody. Now, this is a guy who relieved commanders on a regular basis for not being aggressive enough and not sinking ships, but he does not reveal any of that uh, cutthroatness here at all. It's about the successes and the failures are, are explained like eh, bad torpedoes, bad this, bad that, couldn't happen, bad setup for the torpedo solution. He's not critical of commanders at all, except for one instance, and that was a late war uh, Red Cross sponsorship that was transporting the Japanese uh, injured soldier POWs, I believe, hunt back to Japan, repatriating them. They had a safe conduct lane, and one of his submarines violated that. Uh, I think it was Guardfish. Let me see, no, Queenfish. Sorry, it was Queenfish violated that in the safe uh, conduct lane and torpedoed the ship with the loss of just about everybody. Now, it was found to actually be carrying more contraband at the same time. No big surprise there. But the commander in a rare move of the submarine Queenfish was court-martialed and disciplined for his action here. And this is the only criticism he, criticism he expresses in the book about any of his subskippers. Uh, just, he's, he's interested in unified um, presentation of a good front from the Navy. We all got along like gang gangbusters, and it was all hunky-dory. Belies his, you know, he wasn't quite Captain Hook, but he did relieve inefficient commanders on a regular basis. He's a vice admiral. They do this kind of stuff. So the writing is smooth. The campaign is told in a very cohesive, intelligent manner. And he's got several asides and insights that are, are pretty, you know, actually informative and good stuff. With a, Also with a couple of quirky oddball things here. You know, he mentions like Eleanor Roosevelt comes to Pearl Harbor on a, on a, uh, visit uh, diplomatic whatever she's just touring the country raising spears that kind of thing showing the flag he was put in charge of taking her care of her accommodations and was told by the white house to make sure they procured for her an anglo-saxon maid that sticks out like a sore thumb in this text specifically referencing that and i guess it's kind of a quirky slap in the face about race relations at the time and, and that era I'm not sure how Lockwood comes down on either side of that, but it's just kind of funky that he mentions that uh, as a thing to be noticed. You don't say that casually. Uh, it's, it's really odd. And there's some, several other little instances he covers, instant, you know, incidents he covers during the war that are pretty cool. Like late war, there's a submarine doing lifeguard duty trying to pick up some flyers in, uh, I think, at the Sea of Japan or off the coast of Japan. And they're actually being covered by the, from the air by B-24s with a long loiter time because of their extended range. And they're actually shooting down several Japanese planes while they're covering uh, the downed flyers in, in the ocean until the submarine can get them. That's pretty cool. And there's also another incident in the USS Jack where um, the main induction is leaking from a depth charge attack. And if they get clear of the enemy, they have to surface. And the machinist has to crawl through the main induction pipe for 100 feet to get to this leak and weld it shut or, you know, whatever, duct tape it, whatever, whatever they did back then. And if he had gotten stuck in that pipe, it was curtains for the whole boat, right? As well as the machinist. That's a lot of, of sack right there to do that. Commend that guy heartily. That had to be a nightmare. And it took several hours to accomplish. Oof. Um, oh, and at the end of the war, of course, he's there for the surrender of Japan uh, aboard the Missouri. But his focus is still on the submarines. He briefly mentions the ceremony like it's no big deal. Like, yeah, I was there in Missouri. <laughs> Who cares? But his big focus is I, he got to inspect the I-400 boats, which had the airplane hangars that, to bomb uh, with the seaplanes that were going to bomb uh, the Panama Canal as a war winner for Japan. Cockamamie idea. But he goes through these. It said they had a really unique arrangement. They had a double-decker torpedo room, one above the other four tubes in each. It was bizarre. 137-man crew. And he was really not impressed, especially with the sanitation. He's, and this is a guy who's command of subs. He's lived on subs. He knows what kind of conditions exist with 80 men crammed in a steel tube, right? A 137-man crew was humongous. And he, re he remarked on the revolting nature of the toilet. That had to be awful for him to say something like it was above and beyond reality for him. <laughs> so that kind of stuck out, too. Um, 
he's a bit of a cold warrior at the end. At the end of war, you know, covers the POW situation and rescuing or repatriating U.S. submarine crews specifically, because that was, you know, his ballywick. And, uh, you know, Dick O'Kane comes in there pretty prominently. But then he, I, he's with a lot of pages left. I wonder where he was going with this. And he turns into Captain Cold Warrior. He's got to tell us about the threat of the Soviets and our ongoing defense efforts to meet that threat and what it means for the Navy in the future, as well as the, uh, the unallow, unalloyed shock of what a surprise attack means in the age of nuclear weapons. And he has some rather far-fetched scenarios for how the Russians would go about doing that to us. Focusing on the naval aspect, he has kind of a James Bond approach here with a cargo ship being uh, peacefully docked in a harbor to you know, offload its cargo and actually contain a nuclear uh, weapon and being set off to do a surprise attack and start the next war. It, you know, he doesn't foresee the ICBMs. He does kind of foresee nuclear power in submarines as being a viable thing in the near future. And you know, uh, increased capability torpedoes. But as far as what actual nuclear standoff would look like in the 60s, he's not, he's not foreseeing that accurately. But it's kind of an interesting picture, interesting picture of how the Navy was conceptualizing their next conflict at that time. And we do have a bit of a patriotic fanfare uh, sign-off. It's a, it's a bit over the top, but you can understand the triumphal nature of of the writing because of what he and his submarine force had accomplished uh, against Japan versus what the German uh, U-boat force had failed to do against the Western Allies. He makes a couple references to donuts and his efforts with the U-boats and the mistakes uh, he felt that donuts made, especially the fighting out on the surface with any aircraft weapons against, air, against Allied aircraft in Bay of Biscay. He thought that was a huge mistake. But I don't think he's taking into account the difficulties of geography the Germans had with fronting their U-boat bases on the coast of France to reduce transit time, but also exposing themselves to increased air attack, whereas the U.S. submarines never had to face any kind of issues in that regard. Overall, a very surprisingly good read. I give it four stars. And, you know, from 51 to say it's still worthwhile today for a pre-magic revelation, pre-ultra revelation, I think that's pretty good stuff. So there you go, Sink Em All by Charles Lockwood. Check it out. Next up is The War Below by James Scott from 2012. These days he uses his middle initial too, but this is one of his first books, although maybe not the very first. Uh, let's see. So three submarines against Japan, specifically. Just going to you know focus on three submarines. Silversides, Tang, and Drum. James Scott can drive me crazy sometimes because, as I've mentioned before, he has really good sections where he's very lucid and a good writer, and then he has his bad, bad moments where he is really awful. And he exhibits this tendency here again in War Below. There's some really good sections of narration and exposition, coupled with really bad summaries of specific battle events that he wants to cram in there as kind of like, hey, this let's put this in context for what's going on in the war as a whole, which it's done so badly. I wish he had just bullet pointed a thing in a table in the front of the book. You know, battle this, battle that, battle this, chronological, boom. That way you could reference it if you needed to. What was going on here? And then throw an asterisk in the text to refer back to that table. It'd be a much cleaner presentation than what we actually get here. Uh, the summaries of Guadalcanal and Midway are just, just, chopped, just a chopped up mess. It's really bad. It sticks out bad. But the main narrative here is fine, covering every commander of each of these subs, Drum, Silversides, and Tang. Of course, Tang only had one, Dick O'Kane. And Dick O'Kane is going to be the star of the show anytime he's mentioned, right? Because he's uh, the, I think he's the most successful uh, commander of the subskipper of the war, second most, 24 ships sunk, I believe, 24 or 26, something like that. Absolutely aggressive commander, uh, no fear in this guy. So he's he's uh, the star of the show, but you know, Silver Sides of Drum had you know a lot of good, interesting stuff happening there too. Out of a total force, I think of like 177 submarines were deployed to the Pacific and made combat patrol somewhere along that nature. We lost a total of 52 during the war. Um, not all to due to enemy actions. Some self-inflicted wounds with uh, our own aircraft sinking our subs as well as training accidents and the ever defective torpedo uh, nightmare of the Mark 14s with the Mark 6 Exploder, which Charles Lockwood kind of covers tangentially and nicely, I would say, in his book. 
the battle between Admiral, Admiral Christie, who came, who invented this exploder with this with this torpedo, and its failure and his refusal to acknowledge his failure and a faulty design for over a year really crippled our efforts to take the war to Japan and have a bigger impact than the submarines really did. It could have been even bigger, and, and Lockwood says it could have ended the war six six months or more earlier. I don't know about that because of you know we had we had to close the deal with the atomic bomb, so that that's a bit overclaim. But you'll you know, you know you'll get a full exposure to faulty torpedoes here in uh, the war below, and how bad they were, and how nuts they could drive these sub skippers. There was one one sub. That fired, I think, almost all of its 24 torpedoes with like 14 or 16 failures. That's awful. And it took a year plus with a lot of bureaucratic wrangling between different commands and bureau ordinance to get this thing straightened out. And even after it was straightened out, these torpedoes were not rock solid the rest of the war. And especially as we did introduce the new electric torpedoes, Mark 18s, they weren't sweethearts either. They had a lot of teething problems. As uh, Lockwood mentions, they were copied from the German design of electric torpedoes, and we didn't exactly just copycat it, we tried to improve it, and that led to a lot of issues. But the war below is solid if you want uh, an overall general history, sort of, but chopped down to a more manageable um, take on submarine operations without being just a memoir from one particular, particular guy. If you, it hits that weird sweet spot between large micro right in the middle, Goldilocks kind of thing. So it's pretty good. Uh, I, I wouldn't give this more than three stars just because of the issues with his writing in times. But this is the second or third time I've come back to it, so it's got to have something going for it, right? Bingo. Good stuff. Clay Blair, Silent Victory, 1975. You knew it was coming, didn't you? 800, 900 pages, something like that. Uh, this used to be issued in two volume. This is the one volume trade paperback edition. Uh, it's Bantam, not a war book. It's trade paperback. They ventured into bigger publications at some point. And got to tell you, this cover is not my favorite thing in the universe at all. They could have done better. Even in 75, I think you kind of, uh, uh, graphics are bad there. Anyway. Still available today in a glorious new edition from Naval Institute Press, but you're going to pay through the news for it because that's what they do. So, you know, you can take a pick. I'm sure you can find this in paperback too. I just never looked for it because I've had this copy forever and a day. Clay Blair, uh, as you know from the U videos, this is the guy, right? He was an American submarine. He made two patrols late war in 45 aboard um, a sub, and he was an enlisted man. So he's got the right there perspective he was one of the gang you know prosecuting the war late in the war they're probably just sinking gunboats and sandpans at that point there's no major targets left but he did he was there he was a veteran so he became a historian after war and put out you know history of the korean war and something about eisenhower i believe and then before tackling his major project in the 70s so this is a what uh, a preview of what we're going to get in the hitler's u-boat war later on but done American style. So it does have a little bit of that see your pants, cowboys and Indians. I hate to use that term, but really at times our prosecution of the war against Japan and the revenge aspect and how dare you attack America, it does come through. And that's that's how the subskippers and crewmen framed it themselves. That's how they lived. They're like, we're going to get these sons of bitches. We're going to blast them back in the Stone Age. How dare they? So that comes through. It just, it can't, it bleeds through the pages. It just can't help it. Um, we got, I said, uh, 885 pages, 12 appendices, patrol by patrol. They're just the same format he would use in Hitler's U-boats, but there's far more detail here. We have fewer, uh, you know, about a thousand less submarines operating, or 800 less submarines. In about the same time frame, actually uh, just a little bit shorter than the German U-boats. So he's got time to expand the patrol and tell, tell you more about each one and, and the attacks on various targets along with the submarine and uh, the torpedo issues, which he's going to make a major, major ordeal out of. You're going to get the full measure of the Admiral Christie, Christie versus the world on the, on the magnetic exploder thing here. So be prepared for that. You know, get a, grab a cup of coffee, sit down. You're not going anywhere for a while. It's going to be uh, extensive. It's kind of like a congressional hearing at times. Uh, but, you know, it, this is... Uh, Probably the best overall general history of United States submarine operations in World War II that you're going to get. 
I don't know that anybody has tackled it since. Uh, I'd have to do some digging on that. So I think it's worthwhile overall you know, to have this on your shelf and then take a gander at it. It's good stuff. This is going to be it for the overall strategic presentation of submarines in World War II. I'm going to do another video just on sub drivers themselves and their memoirs. I had considered putting them two together, but that been like a 35 minute video, absolutely unmanageable. So, so that'll wrap it up for today. I am Admiral Hyman Rickover. I'm the J. Edgar Hoover of the United States Navy. You won't be able to kick me out for 40 years. Hope you found something you'd like to read today. And until next time, happy reading.